Hello class and welcome to This Week in Health Psychology. Within this week we will explore how to help people to adhere to healthy behaviors. So I want to start off by talking about narrative coaching based upon some insights from Catrice Horsley. Now how often have you heard the phrase we need to change behavior? whether it's in the classroom, in the office, in the community, in the hospital, caring for someone at home or in the treatment center, or even within ourselves. The phrase is often batted around like a shuttlecock, lightly and quickly. However, if we took the time to explore what it truly means, we would discover it is the opposite from a badminton shuttlecock. It is a weighted thing that moves slowly. It's a complex thing with many layers that have invisible influences. And most of the layers in the influences are invisible to us. So how do you change behavior? I believe it all starts with becoming conscious of the layers of stories that we inhabit and that inhabit us. Now there is a group of therapists that use something known as narrative therapy and I've taught narrative therapy for many years when I taught uh, marriage and family therapy to graduate students. Now. An important thing to think about when we think about narrative therapy or narrative coaching is to look at the essence of the story. So think of a situation that did not go the way you wanted and describe it in the third person. And, and just think about that for a little while. What were you telling yourself at the time? So what was your internal narrative voice? What does this say about how you see yourself? And that's your identity narrative. What did you do as a result of all of that? Your identity narrative is linked to behavior. And what happened as a result of all of that? Now, in order to start to affect behavior change, we then reverse this process. So it kind of goes like this. What would you like to have happen? Your imagined narrative. How could you have done things differently? Your identity behavior. What do you need to change in you and how you see yourselves. You're conscious, becoming conscious of your internal narrative. And how can you say to yourself to change your narrative next time? So you change your narrative. What would you observe in the, if this was the case? So you see that your physical act, actions are linked to this behavior and narrative change. And as you can imagine, it proved to be a very hard thing to do. Changing your behavior is difficult. Changing your narrative can also be difficult, but something to always keep in mind. The thinking always comes before the behavior. And so we need to be mindful of the kinds of narratives that we inhabit and that inhabit us or inhabit our clients or patients. And in order to understand what is going on with a patient, we need to deconstruct those personal narratives. We need to find the loose fibers and reweave them into a fabric that is a new story 
and that's something for the client to do but something that we can do is affirm this new story that changes the behavior for the better so that's just something i want you to keep in mind as we think about adherence the stories that inhabit us and that we inhabit play a profound role in the kinds of choices that we make. Now, I want to kind of clarify, we're going to start off um, talking about compliance and we'll end this lecture, of course, talking about adherence, but they're essentially the same thing. Compliance is the old term, adherence is a new term that, oh, sorry, a new term in the 21st century, really, that emphasizes more the communication between the therapist or the doctor and the patient or client. And Haynes, back in 1979, defined compliance, which is that older term, and adherence, which is that more woke term for the 2020s, as the extent to which the patient's behavior, that is in terms of taking medication, following diets, or ch other lifestyle changes, coincides with medical or health advice. And this adherence or compliance it really excited a, an enormous amount of clinical and academic interest in the 1980s through the to the 2000s with thousands and thousands of articles being written on adherence and compliance. Uh, and overall, it's considered to be primarily important because following the recommendations of health professionals is considered essential to patient recovery. However, studies estimate that about half of the patients with chronic illnesses such as diabetes and hypertension are non-compliant with their medication regimes and that even compliance for a behavior as apparently simple as using an inhaler for asthma is poor. Further, Compliance also has financial implications as money is wasted when drugs are prescribed, prescriptions are cashed, but drugs not taken. Now, Lay in the 1980s and 1990s developed the cognitive hypothesis model for compliance back in the day. And this claim that compliance or adherence can be predicted by a combination of patient satisfaction and the process of the consultation, understanding of the information given, and recall of this information. And several studies have been done to examine each element of this cognitive hypothesis model. So we'll take a little bit of time and take a look at those. First thing is patient satisfaction. Now, when Lee examined the extent of patient satisfaction with the consultation, he reviewed 21 studies of hospital patients and found that 41% of patients were dissatisfied with their treatment and that 28% of general practice patients were dissatisfied. Other research found that levels of patient satisfaction stem from various components of the consultation, in particular the, the affective aspects, so things like emotional support and understanding, the behavioral aspects, things like prescribing adequate explanations, and the competence of the patient, of the doctor. So things like appropriateness of referral or diagnosis of the health professional. Researchers also reported that satisfaction is determined by the content of the consultation and that patients want to know as much information as possible, even if this is bad news. For example, in studies looking at cancer diagnoses, patients showed improved satisfaction if they were given a diagnosis of cancer rather than if they were protected from this information. 
And more recent research has explored the impact of making information more personal to the patient on satisfaction. Participants were asked to read some information about medication and then to rate their satisfaction. Some were given personalized information such as if you take this medicine, there is a substantial chance that you getting one of more of its side effects are this. Whereas uh, some were given non-personalized information such as a substantial portion of people who take this medication get one or more of its effect. So that simple phrase of you directing to you as the individual it can be very important. And these results show that a more personalized study was related to greater satisfaction. Lower ratings of the risks of side effects and lower ratings of the risk to health. Other more current research explored the relationship between humor in consultation and patient satisfaction. And here the authors coded recorded consultations for their humor content and for the type of humor used. They then looked for differences between high and low satisfaction rated consultations. And the results showed that high satisfaction was related to the use of more light humor, more humor that relieved tension. So another aspect of the cognitive hypothesis model is patient understanding. Now, several studies have also examined the extent to which patients understand the content of the consultation. Way back in the 1970s, Boyle examined patients' definitions of different illnesses and reported that when given a checklist, only 85% correctly defined arthritis. 77% correctly defined jaundice, 52% correctly defined palpitations, and 80% correctly defined bronchitis. Boyle further examined patients' perceptions of the location of organs and found that only 42% correctly located the heart, 20% located the stomach, and 49% located the liver. This suggests that understanding of the content of the consultation may well be low. Further studies have examined the understanding of illness in terms of causality and seriousness. Researchers have asked patients what they thought peptic ulcers were, what they were caused by, and found a variety of responses such as problems with teeth and gums, food, digestive problems, or excessive stomach acid. These researchers also asked individuals what they thought caused lung cancer and found that although the understanding of the causality of lung cancer was high in terms of smoking behavior, 50% of individuals thought that lung cancer caused by smoking had a good prognosis. Roth also reported that 30% of patients believed that hypertension could be cured by treatment. If the doctor gives advice to the patient or suggests that they follow a particular treatment program and the patient does not understand the causes of their illness, the correct location of the relevant organ or the processes involved in the treatment then this lack of understanding is likely to affect their compliance with this advice. Pretty obvious. Then we come to patient recall. And researchers have also examined the process of recall of the information given during the consultation. Researchers examined the recall from a sample of patients who had attended a general practitioner consultation and they found that 37% could not recall the name of the drug, 27% could not recall the frequency 
of the dose, and 25% could not recall the duration of the treatment. Other research done found that 22% of patients had forgotten the treatment regimen recommended by their doctors, and in a meta-analysis of the research into recall of consultation information, researchers found that recall is influenced by a multitude of factors. For example, researchers have argued that anxiety, medical knowledge, intellectual level, the importance of the statement, the primacy effect, that is, those statements given earlier rather than later, the primacy effect, and the number of statements increase recall. However, researchers have concluded that recall is not influenced by the age of the patient. And this seems a little contrary to some predictions of the effect of aging on memory and some of the myths and counter myths of the aging process. Recalling information after the consultation may be related to compliance. So recall is part of this process. So whatever we can do to reduce anxiety, to enhance medical knowledge, to uh, repeat statements, to have important statements earlier, in the consultation, the better we will do. Now, what are some ways that adherence can be improved? Well, compliance or adherence is considered to be essential, obviously, to patient well-being. And so studies have been carried out to examine which factors can be used in order to improve compliance or adherence. And the role of information seems to be clear. And as researchers look at the role of information and the type of information on improving patient compliance with recommendations made during the consultation by health professionals, they use something called a meta-analysis. And the researchers have found uh, by looking at the effects of instructional and educational information on compliance and found that 64% of patients were more compliant when using uh, the information that was given to them. Uh, other researchers took a baseline of 52% compliance with recommendations made during a consultation and found that information generally only improved compliance to a level of 66%. However, Haynes reported that the behavioral and individualized instruction improved compliance to 75%. So information giving may therefore be a means of improving compliance. The things to keep in mind are to give behavioral instructions as well as to try to personalize the instructions as much as possible. Some other recommendations for improving compliance. Um, several recommendations have been made in order to improve communication and therefore improve compliance. So under oral information, Lay suggested that one way of improving compliance is to improve communi communication in terms of the content of an oral communication. So the researchers believe that the following factors are important. So the primacy effect, as we've already mentioned, where patients have a tendency to remember the first thing they are told. Uh, to stress the importance of compliance or adherence, to simplify the information as much as possible, to use repetition, to be specific, and to follow up the consultation with additional interviews. Researchers also looked at the use of written information in improving adherence. And researchers examined the effect of written information about medication and found that it increased knowledge in 90% of the studies. It increased compliance in 60% of the studies and improved outcome in 57% of the studies. So 
within that cognitive hypothesis model and its emphasis on patient satisfaction, understanding and recall has been influential in terms of promoting research into the communication between health professionals and patients. So overall, keeping things simple, providing oral information, providing written information is extremely helpful. Now, the, what's about the wider role of information? Uh, now, let's look at something like recovery from surgery. So information seems to be something that is helpful for the recovery and surgery. Now, on the basis that the stress caused by surgery may be related to later recovery, researchers interviewed patients before and after surgery to examine the effect of preoperative fear on postoperative recovery. And these researchers examined the difference between preoperative extreme fear, moderate fear, and little or no fear on outcomes. Extreme fear was reflected in patients' constant concern, anxiety, and reports of vulnerability. Moderate fear was reflected in re reality orientation with the individual seeking out information, and little or no fear was reflected by a state of denial. And the results were that moderate preoperative fear, a reality orientation and information seeking orientation was related to a decrease in post-operative distress. So a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of fear is good. It motivates the person to engage in the process and to seek out information. The extremes of no fear or too much fear can be detrimental to that process. So it's not only seeking out information, it's using the information. Now if stress is related to recovery from surgery, then obviously information could be an important way to reduce this stress. And there are different types of information that could be used to affect the outcome of recovery for a medical intervention. And these have been described as, first off, uh, sensory information which can be used to help individuals deal with their feelings or to reflect on their feelings. Procedural information, which enables individuals to learn about the process or the intervention and what's actually being done. Uh, coping skills information, which helps the, educate the individual on some possible coping strategies. And behavioral instructions, which teach the individual how to behave in terms of factors such as coughing and relaxing and all of this information can be very important um, it's it's essentially important to provide information on what will happen how to behave afterwards and what is clear is that the information supports the best outcomes so overall we have this adherence model. And the adherence model is one of communication. So in that attempt, if you remember at the beginning, we used the term compliance and then shifted to adherence. The idea is the same, only that adherence is really looking to give the power to the patient and is an important role of that is communication. So the adherence model suggests that communication from the health professional results in enhanced patient knowledge and patient satisfaction and an adherence to the recommended medical regime. Now this aspect of the adherence model is similar to the compliance model. Uh, in addition, however, it suggested that patients believe beliefs are important and the model emphasized the patient's locus of control, their perceived social support and the disruption of lifestyle involved in adherence.
So it's giving more power to the patient and recognizing the power of the patient to influence their own health. Really, you can kind of boil down recovery to three factors. Uh, the genetics of the individual and their overall background, the treatment itself, and then the adherence, the behavior that the patient or client engages in within this process. Those three factors, you can think of a third, a third, and a third, really goes a long way to uh, in understanding what it takes to recover and to live a good, healthy life and to make the most out of your health care. That's it for this week, and I hope to see you next week. You take care. Bye-bye.